Good evening. Welcome to Boston Center for the Arts. My name is Lindsay Allen Cox. I'm the director of theater arts, and I'm here with my colleague, who most of you probably already know, <laughs> Andrea Blesso Albuquerque. We just wanted to take a minute before this wonderful discussion got started to welcome you to Boston Center for the Arts, to thank you for being here tonight, and to go over a couple of logistics. Um, you are inside the Calderwood Pavilion at Boston Center for the Arts in Martin Hall. Um, this is our beautiful space where lots of dance and creation happens. Right outside this door, if you go to your left and down the hall to your right is where the bathrooms are located and there's also a water fountain there as well. In the case of the emergency, we have a house manager here who will help us get out of the building, but your best bet is to go out the exact way that you came in. <laughs> um, if you have any questions afterwards about BCA and any of our programs, I'll be here. Andrew will be around for a little while and we're happy to answer those questions. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from Arts Boston and NAC, Audrey Serafin. Wow, okay. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here and welcome on behalf of the Network of Arts Administrators of Color Boston, which is a program of Arts Boston. Um, so this is the third of three panels we have done uh, this season, the September to August season, I suppose, um, which are genre-specific conversations with leaders of color in the arts, specifically classical music, visual arts, and now dance. Um, so before I start, um, I'd like to thank our partners on this event, our incredible hosts, the Boston Center for the Arts, uh, hosted two of our three panels, truly could not do it without them. Um, thank you to our friends at HowlRound. Hello to everyone. This event is being live streamed, which is pretty exciting. Um, so hello to those folks. Um, and thank you to my incredible uh, volunteer next steering committee for making this possible. Extra love to Lindsay Allen Cox and Melissa Molinar for making this happen. Um, uh, lastly, of course, we'd like to, yes, yeah, snaps from Marissa. I'm going to say more nice things about her very soon. Um, and of course our funders, uh, without whom NAC Boston would not exist. So Bank of America, the Mass Cultural Council, National Endowment for the Arts, and Boston Cultural Council. Um, Lindsay took care of my housekeeping agenda, but I will just say there's lots of food, bars open, please feel free to eat and drink. We have to get rid of it all, so please help me eat it. Um, and yeah, so hang out, enjoy. Uh, and lastly, I would like to introduce Marissa Molinar, who's our moderator for this evening. If you haven't met her yet, you're in for a treat. I know many of you know and love her just like I do, but for those of you who don't, Marissa is a professional dancer, arts administrative activist, and the founder and curator of Midday Movement Series, a grassroots initiative designed to train Boston's future contemporary dance teachers while offering a consistent schedule of rigorous classes for advanced and professional dancers. She's the outreach quarter coordinator for Deborah Mason Performing Arts Center, and as of this April, the NAC coordinator at Arts Boston, and a freelance consultant in social media marketing, grit writing, and administration. Marissa is also a freelance contemporary dancer with a background in Mexico folkloric dance and classical South Indian dance and she recently received a New England Dance Fund grant from the New England Foundation for the Arts to create choreography to embody Electra Star, one of the fine art superheroes from local visual artist uh, Basil L. Halawagi. I know you are here and I am sorry if I did that wrong. I wrote down all the pronunciations and I, just, I can't read it. Uh, Marissa has danced with companies throughout the Boston area and she is currently performing with Nathan T. Rice Rituals Dance Theater in New York, and she's a founding member of Ruckus Dance based here in Boston. She's also one of the kindest, most generous folks you'll ever meet when uh, curating this panel. I truly could not think of a better uh, guide for this conversation as she is so beloved by the artist community here. So give it up for Marissa. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. So I am so excited to be having this conversation today. This is my first time uh, leading a discussion and uh, oftentimes you'll uh, either have discussions with me one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, you'll also see me dancing on stage. So this is the first time I have a microphone, which is super exciting. Um, and I'm super excited uh, to be joined by these phenomenal artists uh, who I will be introducing. I would like to start off uh, just giving some introductions about Melissa Alexis. Uh, Melissa is a dance artist, certified yoga instructor, a facilitator, writer, and entrepreneur. Passionate about sharing movement's utility both in and beyond the studio and stage, Melissa founded Cultural, uh, Cultural Fabric in 2016 to help people tap into their inner power to elevate internal consciousness and transform external environments. Her core program, the Healing Arts Institute, guides participants to conduct movement research as critical race inquiry for self and collective healing. Melissa's work also takes the form of leadership coaching, 
public speaking, workshops, performances, and customized business consulting solutions. She is a performer, phenomenal performer, choreographer, also phenomenal, and teacher whose recent credits include choreographing Marcus Gardley's acclaimed play, Black Odyssey Boston, teaching on faculty at Bates Dance Festival 2019, and performing her own original work in Boston Center for the Arts, Hella Black, which was amazing. <laughs> So thank you for being here, Melissa. We welcome you. Yes. Next up, I'd like to introduce Ana Masacote. Ana is an award-winning Latin dance specialist, educator, and womanpreneur who passionately believes that through dance, we can facilitate social change within communities. She is a co-founder and partner of Masacote Entertainment and has spread the salsa bug to more than 30 countries across five continents. Ana is also the producer and executive director of Yo Soy Lola, which is a movement to reclaim the Latina narrative through artistic platforms and a scholarship in initiative for Massachusetts-based Latinx artists, and the founder of Dance to Power, LLC, an online Afro-Latin dance academy dedicated to educating and uplifting women and allies around the world through Afro-Latin dance. Ana was a recipient of the 2015 New England Salsa Music Award for Lifetime Achievement in Dance. Right? <laughs> she was a recipient of the SBA's Massachusetts Minority Owned Business of the Year Award and holds a bachelor's in management science from MIT in Cambridge. She began her formal dance training with folkloric dance at age five and salsa at age 15, and she has been a judge and guest of honor at salsa competitions and festivals worldwide. Bienvenida, Ana. Yeah. Next up, I would like to introduce the one and only Jenny Oliver. <laughs> Jenny is the founder of Modern Connections Collective, has spent, uh, who had, sorry, she uh, has spent the past decade navigating a dance career in performance, teaching, and research. As a magna cum laude graduate with a bachelor's degree in dance from Dean College, and having received the Excellence in Achievement Award from the school at Jacob's Pillow, Jenny has used her years of extensive dance training to create intricate choreographies and to develop integrated teaching practices. She is currently on faculty at Emerson College, Deborah Mason Performing Arts Center, and the Dance Complex, and she is a guest lecturer at Tufts University, where she teaches a course on Haitian folkloric dance and culture, and designed a workshop course entitled African Dance in the Diaspora, in which students explore the Africanist movement as it transitioned through the transatlantic slave route. She is the director of Connections Dance Theater, which has performed at the Boston Center for the Arts 2019 Gala, the Arts Emerson Welcome Party for Pelota, in which uh, held a successful six-show run of their premier evening-length performance, Hot Water Over Raised Fists, here at the Boston Center for the Arts. In addition, Jenny is one of two inaugural recipients of the Boston Dance Makers Res Residency from the BCA and Boston Dance Alliance, and she is the first choreographer for the Museum of Fine Arts Dance in the Galleries program, activating the Ansel Adams In Our Time Gallery with, along with her company. We welcome you, Jenny. And last, but most certainly not least, I would like to welcome Ashton Stiggity Stacks Lights. <laughs> Owner and founder of Stiggity Stacks Worldwide, Ashton has been regarded as one of Boston's most renowned veteran urban dance specialists. As a dancer, he picks apart movement he has gleaned from over 10 years of journeying in styles including crump, popping, locking, house, hip hop, ballet, tap, and jazz, to name a few. <laughs> and pieces it back together to articulate his own fusion of the applications of dance. Ashton's experience compiling knowledge from urban dance legends and innovators from Boston and around the world has allowed him to have major success in the professional dance world as well as in the under underground competition circuit. Beyond dancing and instructing, Ashton has established himself as a creative inspiration specialist and life coach through his journey of activism and public speaking in the city of Boston. 
He is also currently operating a startup corporation centered around life building through urban art. This company has many moving parts, but mainly involves using urban art as a tool to help people build in areas including finances, health, spirituality, purpose, and creativity. Ashton believes that if artists can thrive in these aspects in their own life, they can be of better service to their communities. Welcome, Ashton. So I think uh, we all have a pretty clear picture now of how phenomenal these people are. <laughs> uh, coming from a wide background, uh, as educators, studio owners, consultants, uh, festival curators and producers and wearing tons of other hats. Uh, you have a lot of experience in many different facets uh, with the Boston dance community. Uh, but in addition to that, you also have a lot of experience uh, around the country and sometimes in other countries. Um, so coming from that knowledge, I just wanted to hear from you all. In your eyes, what do you see as being the biggest challenge within the field of dance in Boston. And I think I would like to start this off with Ashton. <laughs> Mixing it up. <laughs> check, check, check. One, two, one, two. Biggest struggle? Biggest challenge. Biggest challenge. I actually like that word a lot better. Um, so I think that my, my biggest challenge as an artist um, in Boston is, I guess, the emotional uh, intelligence that you have to develop to push past uh, the gaps that will come uh, while you're pursuing something that you're really passionate about. Um, it's not always a consistent journey from one thing to the next. Uh, so you have to have some sort of strategy, some sort of will, some sort of creativity to really push past and have a, and have a vision um, for what's coming up like in the future. Uh, so those moments are the, the toughest moments for me as an artist. Uh, is It's kind of like uh, balancing myself and, and finding uh, creative ways to make everything a lot more consistent and last a lot longer. Um, so that's my biggest challenge as an artist in Boston. Yeah, we can pass the mic. Do you want to go around? All right. Um, hello, and thank you all for making time and space to come to this event and listen to us speak. Um, I think that we often have these kinds of conversations uh, kind of in silos and uh, in people's houses and waiting for the train, um, but it's really me is meaningful to be able to have an audience and support from these institutions for us to discuss um, these issues. So that being said, um, there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> and actually, in our um, pre-conversation that we had, Stax has actually said, something that resonated with me, and I thought, ooh, that, I need to think about it that way, that a challenge is really an opportunity, right? A challenge is really something that you can look at and find a new way to approach something. Um, and so that's kind of like put my head spinning a little bit. So I would say that one of the opportunities that it creates for me being in this city is creating, um, creating opportunities that fill the gap that's missing. Um, and luckily, thankfully, we have things like social media, which if y'all are on any of my social media, I've already been like hitting everybody up about this panel all day long. Um, but I think that really being able to get the visibility that sustains us because it's such a transient city, because being a young person in the city, automatically you get disregarded because you went, you're only gonna be here for a couple of years. You're not really here to make work. Um, and so I think that having um, the opportunity or the challenge as it's presented to be innovative with what that filling in that gap looks like um, is a good opportunity for us, but it's also a challenge because 
when you have your own vision and people don't see your vision very clearly, it's hard for somebody to really get behind you and back what it is that you're doing. And oftentimes, we need the support of these institutions. And since they don't see what we're doing because maybe it's so new or so far out there and they're used to doing the things that they know work, um, it makes it really hard to uh, sustain your practice here in the city. Or sustain my practice. Our, our practices, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, well, again, yes, also thank you for coming out here today and hearing us speak. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, I think that there's actually quite a few uh, challenges and obstacles that are in the pathway for dance in the city of Boston, but just in general. Um, I think for me, I like to look at more what are the underlying factors that are causing some of these obstacles. Um, in the city of Boston, we definitely have a lot of wonderful dance companies, but in many times you're made to feel that you're sort of in competition with one another and that you're also competing for a lot of the same funding as a group. Um, and unfortunately, um, I, uh, that can also present an obstacle when you're working in more street styles. So I come from an Afro-Latin dance background, which is traditionally regarded as more of a community work um, and community um, project realm, um, not always regarded as an artistic form when you compare it with Eurocentric styles like ballet and modern, right? So now, um, the ballet is also something that tends to get uh, a lot more support, both on a patron side, someone sponsoring, wanting to donate, and um, it's no coincidence that a lot of the street styles are created by people of color because that's created within our community. We're curating them. Um, I come from an immigrant family. I learned um, we didn't have the funds to pay for a modern dance class, right? We learned um, in our schools, I learned a folkloric dance through my school because it just was offered free, thankfully, at that point. Um, which is an, a privilege in itself, of course. And then I got into cumbias and tejanos through quinceañeras. I was the quinceañera crasher. I would borrow invitations. <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was chaperoned by my mom, that's right, mommy was always with me, so I saw I got into my cumbias and eventually got into salsa and um, tried to explain that when you're applying for a grant, tried to explain why in your field you do a three minute show versus a 20 minute collab uh, production, right, and why there's importance in that. And I learned um, growing up in the dance scene here in Boston as well that it became very difficult to try to explain that to institutions. Why is my uh, form of dance, the street style, so important um, to the community. And I realized that in that process, grant writing was also a privilege in it, of itself. And um, I realized that much of my work was funded more in grants that were more having to take a collaborative approach, which is great. This is a work that I do as well. But when you work in collaboratives, you're also diluting the amount of money that you can make. So then you're also told to apply for less money in that realm and to, make, to, to do that. And unfortunately, sometimes you're given less than what you're given. So you're constantly having to undervalue your work and taught to do that. And so it's been a process in the dance community to both find that value in my work, to really present that forward, and then to articulate that moving forward. How many of us in the audience, so we're having a conversation, how many of us are dancers? How many of, <laughs> awesome. How many of us are choreographers? How many of us dance enthusiasts? That's all of us, right? But I mean, I mean the non-professional <laughs> enthusiast patron potential. I'm just curious. I'm curious who, whether we're, we're, we're all talking together and, and facing these challenges together or whether we have you know, some folks in the room who are listening from a different vantage point. Um, so thanks for, <laughs> for engaging. Um, I would say the biggest challenge that a lot of us are, are pointing to that I definitely felt coming back here, I've been sort of moving back and forth from New York to Boston <laughs> for different reasons. Uh, the most recent reason was to do my graduate work in New York and then come back here because my beloved community is here. And um, so that you know, really compelled me to be here. And at the same time, I felt challenged to be here knowing that um, this is such fertile ground 
for creativity, such fertile ground, the opportunity. I mean, it's, it's huge, the opportunity and the gaps that we can fill, and at the same time, the lack of valuation on dance historically and still today makes it so that, as Jenny said, it's harder for us to sustain our practices. And so the first thing I did when I came back, I heard that Julie Boros was going to be installed as the first uh, chief of arts and culture here. And so I wrote a letter. And the, the letter was called, I really like the title, so now I've got to remember it. It was called, <laughs> the, the Currency of Exposure Has Expired. I thought, I thought about the amount of times that I've done free work here and how much work and how much work. And, and the fact that a lot of this work is being made in the dark, meaning that as, as somebody already said, a lot of it's unseen. And that is, is also a fertile place of creation, which I love, that's a huge opportunity and for us um, in the communities to be you know, really doing this work and we're just about the work. Um, but then it goes unseen and there's a lack of trust, um, being young, unknown, non-institutional affiliated, person of color, all the things, and then the lack of valuation systemically add up to not getting the grants or not having the infrastructure to write the grants as quickly. I formed my company so that I would not be grant dependent being a, a nonprofit professional for over 20 years and still, I want to test out what are the other options? How can we create an appetite in this market for dance across the board, you know, in, in our arts community, but also outside of our arts community? How do, we, how do we make dance enthusiasts? How do we make more so that we can have the robust $1.4 billion that comes into Boston and into Massachusetts, which the recent um, American for the Arts study came out that the arts creates and generates more in the economy than sports in Massachusetts, yet those dollars aren't flowing. They're not flowing here. And so how do we get, them? right, <laughs> right. And so how do we get those dollars flowing, both for infrastructure um, and for support, and so that we're not just grant dependent and we're not replicating the things that, um, the, the same systems, you know, that keep us in these, um, you know, competitive ways with one another where, where we feel like we're in a shortage. Mm -hmm. And so then there's competition, there's silos. We need, to, we need to collaborate. And that's another challenge is lack of collaboration mm -hmm. um, because there's such a, such a, still a dearth, a need. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, so that has me thinking, you know, in, um, in many of the conversation, well, first of all, I, I, one of the things that I hear from each one of you is just how passionately you each use dance as a catalyst for community change. And in going through your bios, I also was just so impressed uh, with the emphasis on using dance specifically for um, really uh, cultural transformation. Um, so especially in uh, thinking about what you mentioned, Melissa, as far as like, uh, giving more visibility to dance. One of the things that comes up for me in uh, conversations, especially with non-dance people, or people who would describe themselves as non-dance people, um, you know, one of the comments I hear so frequently is that there's dance in Boston, you know? Uh, aside from Boston Ballet, where where is that visibility? So um, uh, I think I would just love to hear about because I know the work that you're doing to, to give a push to that visibility. So I would love to hear just um, a, a story of success in, in those terms of how you feel your work, um, either as an educator, studio owner, uh, et cetera, is impacting the visibility um, and creating and or creating uh, that cultural transformation. Ooh, so much pressure to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a uh, success for me, um, I think that I'm, I'm trying to like filter out to one like major, but I've, I've just been like, just like moving, so. <laughs> um, there was a point in time, at least um, when I came into the Boston dance world from the like the underground street style of crump 
Um, everything was just like, I was like super new. Uh, I didn't know about anything, but I caught like the ending of a wave uh, for like Boston hip hop as far as other styles like popping, uh, breaking, uh, like a di the different street style communities that were already a little bit more developed. Because uh, as a crumper, I was just like, a, we were all teenagers. Like we were young kids literally crumping in the street, like everywhere, bus stations, <laughs> supermarkets, <laughs> school, detention, no, I'm <laughs> just literally crumping. So I caught the end of a wave that was developed. Um, and at the end of that wave, kind of there was like a, a gap. So like a lot of the people who had developed and had, had been keeping this kind of energy going, either they left um, or they stopped. And it was just kind of like, I, I caught that in wave and like, uh, like, like she was saying earlier, um, it seemed like it was like a, a, a challenge, but I seen it as an opportunity. So I started getting to work and thinking about how as somebody who's in the middle of a generational gap, how can I bridge that gap? Um, and what I did is like, I, I knew that in order, in order to make that happen, I couldn't do it by standing still. So I just started moving and I started traveling and I started making connections and building community partners. Um, uh, and just, I, I started creating opportunities for people uh, in my, in my uh, community to learn uh, and, but also build and collaborate, uh, not only with just like us as young people, but also with elders in the community. So I really started to kind of like try to fill that gap. And uh, it was like five years ago when somebody asked me like, like what do you feel like um, the Boston street style dance scene needs? And I was like, I gotta sit on that question because we need a lot right now because it's like like cl it's like close to non-existent, and uh, I created a, a event, a festival based off that question, uh, and what I did is I took these like major components that I felt like could really bring um, visibility back, could really bring community back, the feeling, the vibe, uh, could really bring growth and development back. And um, I, I named this, this festival Stacking Styles. <laughs> and it's uh, based off of um, a curriculum that I created to teach kids how to freestyle. And I pulled apart all these different applications that apply to every dance. And um, I seen a couple of events, one in DC called Booger Styles, one up top in uh, Montreal called Jack of All Trades. And they kind of helped me to format the event um, and I was like, all right, let me put this event together. So I knew a major component of that event was going to be um, educating and, and making people aware of how strong Boston street dance history is. Like, we have some amazing, incredible people who change dance, like, all over the world, like, on a, on a ground level. Um, and these people uh, generally go unnoticed to the general public. So I knew that, like, we were going to have to find a way to either document, bring them in. So I created a panel, it's, it's called an OG panel. We call our, our elders OGs, the originals. <laughs> uh, so I have this OG panel at the event and I bring on a different OG every year. Um, and that's from every style. So this year we have two Crump OGs, two Crump, two Boston Crump originators on the panel. Um, and that's always like a, a special type of ceremony. We honor them with an award, um, we showcase their history um, so that the people, uh, which is another component, the people that I bring in from different cultures around the world, like, um, cause there's all these regional dance styles that that are like, they kind of like push the, the overall dance culture, but they're just, they kind of like sit here. Um, and I'm like, they're, they're like the coolest uh, styles ever. So I, I was like, let me get these people that are pushing these styles to come to Boston and share and build with Boston so that we can um, kind of keep an open mind to what's out there. Uh, so I bring in these people um, to also speak on the panel and to teach and to educate. Uh, for instance, we had the first Turfin class, which is a Bay Area uh, dance culture style. Um, we had the first class, uh, Turfin class in Boston. At Stacking Styles, 
we had the first Memphis Jukin class. Uh, and if you don't know these styles, you should definitely go look it up because they're amazing styles and they just breathe culture. They breathe that essence. Um, so that's the second component, bringing in people and making it easier for guests to come in to Boston to share and build. Um, and I created a program called Stack BNB. <laughs> Airbnb, don't sue me. <laughs> but it's an exchange program uh, for housing, uh, which is going to make it even more easier for out of state dancers to travel in and come and break bread and build with the dancers here in Boston. And the people in Boston can house people um, on a vault, like pretty much. They're offering free housing in exchange for like a Skillshare. So like there's people coming and there's people that came in from the event from uh, Senegal. There's people that came from the Ivory Coast. There's people that came from Colorado. There's people that came from Montreal. There's people that came from all these different places and they got to like stay for free and uh, meet and break bread with dancers in Boston and build a connection. And like that was like the, the ultimate goal is like when I throw these events, Yes, it's a battle, a competition, a showcase with workshops, but the ultimate goal is to like build connections so that we can feel like we have this community. It, it exists. We can go anywhere. Like at this point right now, like uh, from all the the work that I've done in that community, like the community is so big but so small that like I can go like anywhere in the world and just do the power of like street dance and hip hop. I can be like housed and taken care of and like break bread, so uh, the success that I'm, I'm bringing to the table is that that festival, and uh, it was like extremely successful last year. Like I, um, we got way more participants than I anticipated, uh, and it's really kind of blowing up and it's getting visibility. Um, I actually got uh, the Boston Foundation grant uh, to help out with the, with the event, uh, and I got it again this year to help out as well. Um, I've also connected with some community partners who've been supporting some sponsors. Um, like recently, I've I've just been chopping it up with like Red Bull, and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, we wanna we wanna get on that, like we wanna. <laughs> um, so I I I feel like that's a major success to be able to bring that forth, um, and really watch the community like kind of show up for itself. Um, I make the event kind of this space where everybody can kind of chip in and put their hands on deck because we really do need the push um, here in Boston. Um, I think that as artists, we feel, uh, it, it, I don't know what it is, but I, I was having this, I went on live last night and I was kind of uh, cussing my, co my community out. Not really, but, <laughs> um, you know, when it comes to these these bigger brands that come into the culture, they their, their goal is to try to, connect with what we already have established and what we've already built. Um, but as dancers who who are coming from an area where there's a lack of opportunity, we feel like we have to chase those brands when they're really looking to like get on our wave. So like um, the fact that Red Bull, a rep from Red Bull came to my house in my studio and was like, yo, we, we wanna push, we wanna help you. Like we wanna understand what it is that you do because it's impactful, so I feel like um, it's, it's just a major success to see it grow from just an idea. Um, and, and rather than being in the scene and being like, oh, there's no events going on in Boston, there's no this, this, rather than complaining, I was like, yo, let me just take a step forward and just like put my money on the table and my time and my resources and my focus. So that's my, my thing. <laughs> um respond to something that you said. So I uh, have been in Boston since 2005 and I actually always housed dancers at my place. Mostly when I was in the tap community, people come from out of town, they need a place to stay, they stay with me. I, I tried to feed them, <laughs> uh, but you could take a shower, you could sleep. Um, and since we neighbors, you know, I'll extend that also, you know, oh, that, you know, I would love God. to be able to house, house somebody. Um, Cause I think that we do need that and it's us that takes care of us, you know? Um, so that's important, kudos. Um, as far as success, I'm gonna put my, I have, I have a lot of successes, thanks to God. Um, but I'm gonna lean more towards education because for me, 
Um, it's really been my training that has sustained me and my training that has allowed me to dance now into my 36th year, um, which isn't always easy to do in Boston because I think that you graduate from school and you know, you're very limber and flexible and cute and all the things and then all of a sudden you get a nine to five and you're sitting down and like you're not able to keep up with what it is that you're doing um, physically and we know that as dancers we need to be moving. Um, so one of the things that had really saved me is the Horton Tech Technique, which is a codified modern dance form. And when I first came to Boston, um, there wasn't a Horton class. Or actually, there was one, and it was like a one-off. It happened occasionally. Um, and so I was like, well, I don't understand why this isn't happening. Feedback that I get is, oh, nobody wants to take a Horton class. Nobody wants to do codified stuff. Everybody's doing contemporary improvisation. And like, you need to, telling me, you need to be doing this if you want to really get success here. And I'm like, well. There goes that gap again. I, you know, how do I fill that gap with something that I know actually works for me and has worked for my body? And if it works for me, it will also work for others. Um, one of the gaps, as I decided this is what I was going to do, is money, right? Because a, to learn a codified form, it's really difficult to learn it outside of an institutional setting. Mm -hmm. If institutions are costing 50, 60, 70, 80 plus thousand dollars to go to, who has access to that? Not some of us, most of us, you know, I mean, l luckily I went to school when it was like 20 grand and I still owe them money. <laughs> I'm working on it though. Um, but you know, how do we create, how do we create an opportunity in something that's becoming such an elitist um, form? And so I created Modern Connections, which is a Horton based modern dance class. I put my money where my mouth is. I went to the Ailey School after I've, I've already been trained with Naila Randall Bellinger um, and I have all training throughout, I keep continue on. And then I was like, well, wait a minute. Let me go to the Ailey School and go get me some Anna Marie Forsyth and like have her put me together. Um, so I invested in actually learning the pedagogy to accurately teach it. And then I brought back all the skills that I have just in me being a person that grew up in the neighborhood and has all this other information in my body um, and making it, making it, um, making modern dance something that's exciting and not just like boring, um, something that is attainable for people. I think that sometimes codified forms feel unattainable. It feels like there's a lack of success. Um, so I often try to like push that gap as well. And then the third thing is that I really try to keep it affordable. I mean, I think that paying, I know that we are not as, as expensive as New York. New York, it costs $22 to take class. Well, $15 is also expensive for people that can't afford groceries or can't afford a bus pass or your rent is $2,500 and now you can't dance too, but we wanna say dance is for everybody? No, dance is for the elite. And so I am here and my success has been, um, actually my, my anniversary is coming up um, because my Modern Connection class has, is now gonna go into its sixth year I've been able to sustain it. I've been able to start a, a level two. I've been able to start a summer session that has been jam-packed every single week. 17, 22 people that are coming out to learn a codified form when I was told that nobody wants to take a Horton class in this city. Um, and, I'm all, and I'm able to do it in a way that makes it affordable for people. I don't turn people away. I have a class card that makes a class like 11 bucks. Yes, that still maybe is too much, I've never told anyone, well, you can't take class. I often um, either supplement people or try to barter with people and say, hey, maybe we can make a trade and you can do something, you know, to make this thing happen because I think that I believe in the dance form so much. Um, it saved me and it's also given me the opportunity to traverse a very difficult um, scene here, I think, not only in Boston, but I think that it's a difficult scene to maintain your body, and this is a form that can actually do that. So that's one of my successes, is to go out on a limb and do something when I was told not to do it and keep it affordable for people. Um, well, I mean, I'm hearing definitely a theme about investing in our work and in what we're believing in, um, even though, Sometimes people won't believe it for you, right? <laughs> um, I will say that for me, um, I've been blessed to have a company that's now going on 15 years. Um, yeah, we're celebrating our quinceanera. I'm on a quinceanera team, right? So <laughs> um, and it's been a lot of work um, really building that up. And uh, 
But I will say that during the time that, I was with, that I've been with the company, I've been working on a lot of community work, but um, a little over three years ago, I felt that I wasn't really able to invest my time into the things that really like were moving me. And so I made a pivot. And what I did is I basically sat down and I really decided what were the things that I really wanted to focus on and how could I change up my, my time to make that happen so that I could invest in that. And so that meant giving a lot on that end and really investing in something that I believed in. Um, so during that time, I changed up my dynamic at my, at my company and I completely um, pulled away into, um, from the things that weren't serving me and pushed my time into things that were. Um, and it meant that um, for the good, the um, close to the first year, um, what my, much people don't know is that I really just paid myself $900 a month. If you know what the cost of living in Boston is, you know that that's not very good. And I lived off my savings in order to invest my time into my community work. Um, during this time, I started up an initiative called Yo Soy Lola, um, which is Latinas Orgullosas de las Artes, or Latinas Proud of the Latin Arts. And the goal of that initiative is to really reclaim our narrative so that we change the way that we're perceived in artistic mediums. Um, and it's also a racial equity incubator for bu building more Latina identifying artists within the commercial spaces in Boston. And um, we worked on that for the better part of a good six months, and we'd been working with the good 20 plus artists to develop this big production, get it into Oberon, a very big space here in Boston, and we were developing this immensely amazing production, and a month before, as much as we'd been promoting it, not one single ticket had been sold. And I had a little bit of a panic attack first. <laughs> And then I let myself have that moment, and then I leaned on my community, and I started talking to people and asking, what were we doing wrong? What did we need to do? And we took on a very different direction in our grassroots marketing. We, um, had, our, we had our friends buy tickets. We called up the primas. We called up the hermanas. We had everybody come in, everybody that we could think of at the wazoo, and tell their friends. We also changed the way that we were redirecting our marketing. And by the time that we were done, we ended up selling out that event, had people out the door that couldn't get in. And it completely astonished the staff at this location. It was something that was truly, truly unexpected. The beauty of that is that during this time, this is also a nonprofit initiative to get more scholarships for Latinx artists. So by creating these events, we're also paving the way for more in our community. And we were able to raise funds for three scholarships at the event. Now, this year, we're going to be building into a big week of events, so it's a Lola week, so that during the time of October, um, you'll find um, during this particular Lola week events all around the city just amplifying, celebrating, and building up Latina identifying artists within the city of Boston. What to me has been the most amazing success is that we may have been able to create that platform and amplify more voices, but this year, um, the culmination of that, which was what really reminded me why we're doing this, is when I received a text from one of our first scholarship recipients, and she sent us her certificate that she had just graduated. And that to us was a reminder that we might help a lot of people do things, but sometimes even just helping one person is all we really, really like are meant to be doing at the end of the day. And so you do that one, Thing at a time, and this particular individual is looking to create more businesses, so they create more access points, so we're bringing that more and building that within the community. So to me, that was a huge, huge success and something that keeps me moving forward. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, so, a lot of you raised your hands a couple of times when I said dancer, choreographer, enthusiast. So we all have these different aspects of ourselves. So I'm gonna say first of all that my, I really feel like it's been a success to be able to live into the different aspects of myself. Mm -hmm. That I'm a performer, that I am a choreographer, that I'm a teacher, educator, facilitator, 
a writer, that I can do all of those things, that I've created a mechanism to really live and breathe into those aspects um, and to share that. And, and I feel like to also share with young people coming up that you don't have to just do one thing. I feel like that's the, that's the myth that's sold to us, that you just, oh, you know, what, so what's the one thing that you really do? <laughs> like, no, all these things, <laughs> do all these things. Um, and so for me, that mechanism in cultural fabric um, has really been the vehicle, you know, for me to really breathe life into all those aspects. And so I'll just talk a little bit about the Healing Arts Institute, which was a program I created in 2018 after, um, really running around how many of us as teachers, educators have been at multiple sites for, I don't know, months on end and thought, oh, I don't know how sustainable this is, <laughs> as a, you know, in terms of energy. And so I, I did, I like the word pivot, that's what I did too. In 2018, I really stopped and reflected and, and decided to pivot um, to, from, you know, running around to these sites where I was teaching dance is in part of many different contexts, um, in healthcare context, in community, other community settings and community centers. Um, and realizing that, you know, the pace of that meant that there is a great need and desire and want for dance in our communities. And I wanted to help others be able to join me in you know, answering that need. So I created the Healing Arts Institute as a mechanism to replicate myself without replicating myself as carbon copy, but to replicate and, and sort of try to share methodology so that people can create their own programs if they desire or create their own businesses. Um, so the Healing Arts Institute really became about when I, you know, went through the first cohort, which was so beautiful, filled with dancers of their souls from all different sectors, um, from medicine, from education, other nonprofit professionals, social service professionals, um, who really were dancers in their souls. I mean, when you see people dancing just so authentically, and they're like, no, 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 I'm not a dancer. No, yes, you are. <laughs> um, and, and dancing in, the, in those ways to examine themselves, to examine their communities, to examine the wounds and the resiliencies um, that exist after this, ra you know, this racialized history that we all share. Um, and to, to really use the resiliencies and the technologies of Africa and, and African diasporic um, dance, drumming, and other technologies, including yoga, to really see how, how we can heal ourselves and in healing ourselves also heal our communities. Um, and so that, so far we've had two cohorts and out of that um, at least two to three people have created their own programs and businesses um, and are going on to teach people in their own unique ways. So it's really a program where people workshop their research. They're workshopping their research in movement, in action, um, in real time with groups of people and in this very vulnerable uh, way that I, I just love, mm, I just love the interiority of that, uh, the, just really examining our being, not just through yoga, but also through dance, you know, just really using dance as that, as that gateway into ourselves. And then, and then taking it back out of ourselves and being able to share that um, and amplify that. So that has been a huge success, is to be able to offer that space, hold that space with others, and then lift up other people who are spreading that now to others for, for our collective healing, really. Um, so that's been beautiful. Thank you all. Um, so it's so good to hear about the change that you really are uh, living to create the transformation that you want to see in the world. Um, I know that that transformation can't happen by ourselves, right? Um, so from your perspectives and coming from all of your experiences, I'd love to hear uh, what is one thing that you uh, would like to see from the grassroots and institutional communities to help you create the change that you're really working for? And I would love to start with you, Melissa. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm holding the mic, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, Definitely, I, I want us to get creative. I want us to take back the decision making um, so that we're not just looking to one institution or some big institutions or foundations for our funding, um, but really getting creative and, and, and collaborating and banding together. Like can, we, can we get this kind of unity around funding, around other needs? 
um, for, for us all to move forward in this field. Um, so that's the first thing for me, is um, just really looking at that. And then also putting dance into the conversation around public art making. I feel like a lot of times there are grants and other opportunities that are out there, especially now around social justice um, and public work, and dance is left out of that conversation, left out of that funding, um, yet I know every single one of us perform in the community, literally on the streets, <laughs> um, that public, yeah, <laughs> that public dance is a huge part of how we just meet people right where they are, right where we are. Um, and so putting, putting that back into that conversation and, and leading that conversation, I think we have a lot to share in that realm. Um, grassroots and institutional level, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, on a grassroots level, um, I would love to see much more um, networking and resource sharing happening amongst the community. Um, I definitely wish that there was more cross-collaboration, and I found that as I was looking for mentors to help me direct where I needed to go, they were telling me they needed mentors too, and it made me realize, you know, there's something that I can help someone with, and there's something that they can help, that someone else can help me with. And so if we can create much more networking, that will help us a lot. So um, grassroots level, I'd love that. On an institutional level, um, there's this buzzword around diversity initiatives, right? Um, and I think it's very easy to say that you're funding work by um, artists of color, um, but I think it's very irresponsible for you not to realize that there's different access points that people need along the way. So this week alone, I've had conversations with some 20 plus artists, right? Of those, one is homeless and trying to raise a young child on her own, um, doesn't have access to email, right? So we have to find new ways of communicating. Another one was talking to me out of Dominican Republic and I needed to send them their information that they needed before a certain time or they wouldn't, they would lose the electricity to be able to respond to me. Um, there's another artist that's also raising a child on their own and they don't have the time to go out and write a grant for the work that they need. So understanding that if you're going to be really intentional about supporting work by artists of color, you also have to be intentional about understanding and trying to understand what they actually need instead of thinking that you're going to do that for them. So um, on an institutional level, I'd love to just see institutions getting committees of artists together and just asking, how can we help? Yes, to all of that. Um, uh, yeah. So I think that at a grassroots level, something that um, we, that I found success in, that I think that we need, could all do right now, um, is to engage more publicly, like publicity. For instance, I just had my show, um, and it was a great run. We sold out four out of six shows. I think that that was like amazing, but where was the publicity? Me, me writing all the social media things, me writing a press release, me trying to like beg people, can you, Jared Bowen, where you at? You don't come to the dance community. I see, I hear you all the time talking about other great things that are happening. Um, in art in Boston, but I don't see you here with us as dancers amplifying what it is that we're doing, um, and that's really hard. But I think that, again, there's that gap, right? So there's the gap that we can fill, and all of us can fill that by using social media. Social media is changing the game, whether you wanna believe it or you don't wanna believe it, or like that's the last thing that you check on your to-do list, it is happening. Social media turns into dollars and gets people in the door. And I think that that's something simple that doesn't require, well actually it may require people to have access to internet and all of those things, but if we do have access to it, um, it shouldn't only be on the person themselves to be like, you should come to see this thing or you should come support this thing when we're all in this community together. And I find that um, 
at a grassroots level that we don't really do enough of that networking um, to amplify each other's work. And even for me, I mean, I could also do even more, but sometimes I'm like, well, damn, I gotta do my own, because if I don't do it, no one's gonna do it for me. How am I gonna get people to know that I even exist in this city if I'm not pushing my own stuff? Um, and so at a grassroots level, I would say that that's like a simple thing that we can do. Um, share a flyer, I used to go flyering, for real, for real, like all over. Posting, posting, taping, going to Davis Square, all the things. Um, so that's one thing. Yeah, okay, see, okay, but yes, and I would like to do that, and there's oftentimes I'm like, this would be a game changer for getting more access to people that are not in the dance community, but who has time to do that? You know, when you don't have a team, when you have to write the grants and respond to the emails and choreograph the thing and cut the music and be here for this one and be here for that one, it's not sustainable. Anyway, so yes, <laughs> institutions. So we did use that, the, the word diversity. And I think that some of the challenge is, at the institutional level, is that there's not enough diversity, people of color at the top making the decisions. So when you get an application, or you get something that comes across your, your desk, it's easy to be like, oh, well, there goes those people doing that thing again that I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and so like, you know, we'll wait, we'll wait until like it fits, you know, we have this gap and we, we should have like a person of color in here. So like, why don't we just put this person here? because I think that there's not enough people at the higher level that are making the decisions that understand this language and this culture that we're all creating from. And sometimes that um, makes it really difficult for people to access because you don't know what our struggle is or what, or the, what our joys are all the time because we, we are different people. We have different things that we value and I would love to see um, more POC people at the top of these institutions making decisions that will give us more of an opportunity to have a chance to sustain ourselves and to be recognized. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> they done said it all, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, they, I think they covered pretty much the ground. I would say one last thing, um, which is, these are gonna be answers that are reflected in what they all said. I think that like on a grassroots and an institutional level, we have to like, we have to be willing to get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like I see that like there's a lot of uh, motion in Boston, but I think that the, the pathways of that motion are all very stagnant. Um, like we really do, like if we wanna get in touch, if we wanna collaborate, if we wanna network, if we wanna build, uh, if we wanna exchange more across cultures, like we have to be willing to just like get uncomfortable and show up and, and do those things that you might not be interested in really doing and, and like show up to those places that don't really, like when you look at it at first glance, they might not catch your eye or they might not spark anything, but just like show up, you know what I mean? And, and um, you know, put yourself out there uh, to be able to build and make those connections. I think it takes a little more effort than uh, just like a conversation, or like, or saying you're trying to, I think it takes like a lot more reaching, like not just showing up once, but <laughs> going back, you know, and if you're not connecting to something, it doesn't mean that that's the end all be all, but like really like trying to, to get into the groove. And then along, um, along that same lines, I think that on both levels, like we have to do a lot of um, a healing, like on a personal level, internally, um, I, across collaborations that I've been in and, and seen uh, moving. Uh, a lot of people are bringing uh, traumas to the workplace, or traumas to the art, which can be a beautiful thing, but when it comes to like working with people, uh, it also can create uh, sort of a backlash. Like I see a lot more people not working together, not working together because there's some type of trauma or situation or whatever the case may be. So I feel like um, we got to put the the focus on that that self care uh, and really try to open up and and when we come into the space and we when we get into these spaces, we we're here with clear hearts, clear minds, uh, clear voices, so that. You really can just like push. Mm -hmm. You feel me. <laughs> yeah, so we, we were talking right before the panel started about the transient nature 
of some of us, the coming, the going, the coming, the going, somebody's leaving. <laughs> and I was just thinking, you know, stay. So I'm talking to myself, I'm not talking to anybody else. Um, because, you know, you gotta go where your joy is. But there has to be some pressure from at the grassroots level from artists in the city. Um, so we can talk about institutions all day long, but at the end of the day, we are the artists. And so we have to really band together. So to me, it's about that collaboration. It's about that collective energy, always. We need more of it. Um, I think this is a wonderful platform, and could we, could we come back again? And next time, let's have dancing, too. Um, <laughs> I think we were all a little daunted by, oh my gosh, we're just going to talk. Can, can we just do an interpretive piece to respond to this? Um, so yeah, we've, we've got to keep coming together. We were brainstorming about that on the phone. We're all, we're all going to um, Stiggity's uh, studio. Stack, stack, Stiggity stacks. We're going to your studio next. That's what's happening. Um, so, so, <laughs> so we've got to rotate. We've got to keep coming together. Um, but yeah, I just want to sort of put it, put it back on us to, to, to keep on putting the pressure um, for change, if we want to see change, if we want to see expansion here. Because I, I've definitely done the, I'm in New York, I'm back, I'm in New York, I'm back, I'm in New York. And I, I might go again, I, I don't know, but I'd like to stay. This is where my beloved community is, so how do we make it so that artists can stay? Yes, well, and I would also just like to take a moment since uh, the uh, topic of connecting via social media did come up. We do have a flyer with all of our panelists' social media and uh, contact information. So as just a very simple way of staying connected to them, I highly suggest that you snag one if you have not already. Um, so let's see. Uh, we've been talking a lot about what is, and I'm wondering about like what is coming next. You all do a lot of work also empowering uh, the artists coming up, the next generation. Uh, so to those artists, what is the one thing that you will say to them? And since we're a little bit pressed on time, I would also like to encourage us to be specific about our responses. Okay, wait, I, cause I actually, I, 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 the, yes, I wrote notes. <laughs> I wrote notes. <laughs> um, say the question one more time. What question was that? Four. Uh, uh -huh, the That's fourth four. question to the next okay. generation. Um, so I think that what I would say to the, to the next generation and something that I see, first of all, I see all of y'all, all of y'all on social media, I see you all. <laughs> I follow all the hashtags. You put a new hashtag on your, on your, on your post, I follow that one too. Um, so I think that the young people in the community are doing a great job of connecting to themselves. And I think that um, being a person that was there in 2005 and walking around here like, who, what do we do next? Um, I think that what I would offer is that we, that you all and us take the time to go to each other's things. Um, and I don't mean that in a passive way. I don't mean that as like a sugar coating, whatever. I spent a whole year going to a bunch of stuff that I didn't understand, that I didn't like, that was out of my genre, whatever, because I knew the value of a dollar, I knew a value, the value of my community, and I said, you know what? I'm gonna buy a ticket to this thing and see what it's about. And then once you start to really build this practice of support, um, people will come back around, oh, we've seen you there. I even, when I first started doing that, people were like, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, wait, is this not a space for me too? You know? So I think that as um, young people, I think that you all, bravo to you, you all are changing the game, I see you, um, and I would offer for you all to come to things that we're doing as seasoned people here, um, and you all will become seasoned eventually. And then also I challenge all of us that are in the room to go to these young people's events that they're producing on their own, that they're raising funds for, that they're having rehearsals 9, 10, 11, I, that's why I can't be a part of your group, because um, it's past my bedtime. Um, you guys are re rehearsing you know, late at night and doing all the things and then collaborating with videographers and putting out your own promos and like all of that stuff, and I really respect that. And I would say that um, what I offer for you again is just to connect more and show up to things that you might go to a ballet show. Might not be your favorite thing, um, especially for some of the street dances, I don't know. But you might find inspiration there too, you know. So I, I would just offer, offer that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, all right, all right. I'm going to 
fight over the mic here. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to piggyback off of this because I think it's important to mention that with social media as well. Um, so we're really, I feel like so many of us are concerned um, with, you know, how many likes do we get? How many comments do we get? Who shares our posts? And then we forget to do the internal work to actually work within the community because it doesn't matter, you know, when you're going through something tough, the people on your Instagram aren't the ones that are going to hold your hand, right? So um, really investing in your community is so important in building relationships. Um, what I'd say and I'd offer, this is really just kind of for anybody at any point because I'd, um, I'd been in the industry like a good 20 years before I decided I was going to pivot and I did this exercise. Um, Basically, I took a, I made a list of the things that I was very passionate about, what issues moved me, and I wrote down why, and I explained that to myself, and I kept asking myself, why is this important, and why is this important, and why is this important? And um, I wrote my story, and that helped me understand why these issues were so important to me, and this is what I wanted to focus on. Then I wrote a mission statement, and I wrote a vision similarly to what you would do in a business, because if we don't know where we want to go, then how do we get there, right? Then I made a list of the people that were doing some of this work that I wanted to support and align myself with, and I started building relationships. Not in a place where I was thinking, I'm going to go network and I'm going to meet people to see who I can get something out of, but who can I help and really like support and really work in these areas that I want to do. So um, just a suggestion that that's probably what I would offer, just a simple exercise. What I would say to um, the younger generation about forward motion uh, is just to, to start and just keep going. Like, I grew up around a lot of young creative people. I grew up around people um, who were a lot more creative than I, than I was, but because the results weren't as quick, um, they either became uh, less interested in, in pursuing or um, they started to go in another direction, which is, there's no problem in that, but like, um, I feel like the the only thing that that really solidifies me in the position that I'm in now is just the consistency of just like whatever it is that I that I like that I that I, I had a heart for like I just didn't stop um, and also to not be afraid to ask I think that um, we recreate the will a lot uh, across the board like there's a lot of like I feel like there's so many people who have walked this path before me. There's so many people who have walked this path before us. Um, and I get the most, uh, I feel like I, I get the most development from learning from people who have been there or learning uh, from people who have that type of wisdom and experience to offer. So definitely just asking, even if the answers don't come right away, I'm a little annoying and uh, persistent. <laughs> so like, you know, if I don't get the answer from that person, it's gonna be the next person, and then the next person or the next thing, or I'm gonna, um, you know, look for it in a book or maybe, you know, a, a source on the internet. But like, I'm gonna like, like whatever I, whatever I need to, to go, wherever I need to navigate, like you just gotta be 100% about it. Uh, it's, it's the willpower, I feel like, that uh, we got to develop, you know, even as a community, some type of community willpower. That's like, even when the, when the, the tough gets, gets tough, <laughs> like, we just got to keep that will spinning um, and work through those, work through the trenches. So um, I think that's the most important part because, you know, we're all creative in nature and we all have these ideas that are flowing through us. I just think that... Um, you know, a little, a little persistence uh, can really go a long way. You know what I mean? So, shall I? So, I, I just had the blessing of um, being with the young people at Bates Dance Festival and ages 14 to 18. Generationally, this generation coming up, it just affirmed for me that every generation is like 2.0, 3.0. We're at like 5.0 with my niece and nephew, I think. They're incredible. 
but the, the, that generation coming up, they have a language and, a, and an embodied knowledge of the kind of fluidity across gender, across um, uh, race, ethnicity, background, language, dynamism in language, and, and th there's something, th they're amazing. There's something amazing coming for future direct, uh, generations, and I, the only thing that I try to continue to add, and I see this as the through line in all of my work about that inter interiority, that, that place of attuning to yourself inside to really understand just what Anna was saying in terms of your personal mission and vision to always reattune to that, because there is so much noise and there is so much disconnection created by technology. Technology is another blessing, but also can have its major, major disadvantages in the ways that it fragments us from ourselves and from other people. Um, and so I think that, that the generation to come is going to have to really gra grapple with that, and we're grappling with that um, in very real ways. But to continue to use dance and use these other ways of embodied knowing and to respect it, to respect that dance is a way of knowing. And it's really, in my, in my and other people's conception, the only way of knowing is when you experience. Information, we're in the information age, and what? So I get bits and bits of information, does that mean I know something? I don't really know something until it's through my system, and then I really know something. So respect that, and, and I think with that attunement and respect, this generation that's coming is going to, I mean, we, we're sitting here, we, yes, we're, we're doing what we can now and, and for, <laughs> I mean, I should make it sound like that. <laughs> we're, we're doing lots of amazing things. But I, I just continue to affirm that, that we are doing these amazing things for all the generations to come and, um, and paving the way as people did before us, for us. I mean, the people I think about who we connect back to, um, it's amazing. So, and we're here. Right? And, we're here. Nice. and we're here. Absolutely. Absolutely here as the mentors and the, you know, just the ear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Wonderful. <laughs> so, so, we are just about to wrap up this conversation. We have about uh, two minutes. Um, but I think that this last question is very important. Uh, and that is just to leave us with something actionable uh, that we as the audience can do to help propel this new culture forward. And I would challenge us to hopefully uh, nail it down to a one sentence answer, if possible. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> Fund dance, patronize dance, go often, collaborate as artists, and create a resource. Whoever wants to take this one on, any developers out there in the online world, uh, create a resource so that we can bring what's being created in the unseen, in the dark, uh, to, to the visible light in Boston, widely. Um, we concern ourselves a lot around who we are by who we're with, but I think that we should also look at who we are not with. So who's not in our spaces? Um, create more accessibility for dance. Shout out to Ellie and the Abilities um, uh, Initiative and Silent Rhythms, who's not in the room, but I really appreciate them. So find out um, what who's not in the room and bring that to them. Um, I will say that something actionable, actionable I think things that I've said already, um, you can tell somebody provide, amplify this conversation that happened. I think that for since 2005, I've been sitting and talking and having the same type of discussion over and over and over with different people and we all get jazzed and then we leave here and then that's it. It like fizzles and fades um, and then we wait for the next wave and we have this conversation again. So I think that my actionable item would be for us to continue this conversation in whatever way feels good to you, whether it's going for coffee, going for a walk, sharing something on social media, calling your mom, whatever it is <laughs> that um, is gonna help to amplify what is existing right now in this space, um, I challenge us to all take action, all of us. <laughs> and I'll just wrap it up by saying, come through. You know what I'm saying? My doors is open all the time. Just come through. Yes. Actually, yes. 
like, yeah, come, come on. Th- oh, I'm, I'm out for two weeks. I'm, you know, like, right. <laughs> as soon as you're back from Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just come through, like, you know, just show up. Uh, find something, you know. If you can look in your phone right now, go on Facebook, type in dance at the top, type in events near me, you know, find something grassroots, find something that's that's building, find something that's growing, that's different, and just show up. And then don't only show up, but bring a friend, mm-hmm. you know. Bring some family, you know what I mean? Be like, listen, I know y'all comfortable where y'all at right now, but y'all need to just come with me. We about to go on a little exploration, a little adventure, um, you know, and that's, that's actionable. I feel like that's... That's worthy. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you all so much. And if you would join me in thanking these panelists for some great conversation. And I think that is everything. Yes, give it up one more time for Marissa and all of our fantastic panelists today, our tech friends at HowlAround, everyone who made this possible, our, our beautiful host of the BCA. We still have lots of food. Um, bar still open, so um, I encourage you to, you know, say hi to someone you didn't know before. Um, say hi to our panelists if they're open to that. Um, and remember to grab a sheet if you want to keep up with all the amazing work that they're doing in our city.